Hello, everyone, and welcome to Controversy at Noon, an online series that discusses and explores the important and sometimes contentious issues that impact the publishing industry and the writing community at large. The Writers Guild of Alberta would like to thank the Rosa Foundation for their generous support of this online series. Now, my name is Marty Chan. I will be the moderator for this panel. I recently received the Golden Pen from the Writers Guild of Alberta. Today, I'm primarily known as a kid's author. In fact, my newest book is coming out in a few weeks. It's called Izzy Wong's Nose for News. Uh, but I also have a background in theater. And uh, one of my plays is Mom, Dad, I'm Living with a White Girl. Now, today, I'm proud to say that I'm doing my part of this virtual panel from the beautiful city of Amiskwichi, Wiskaiken on Treaty 6 territory. And here's a photo. Well, it's not a recent photo because right now, if you looked at Edmonton, it would be shrouded in smoke. Uh, but I would like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge the many Indigenous people who cared for this land. They include the Nehewak, who gave Edmonton its original Cree name. Also, I'd like to recognize the Anishinaabe, Nitsitapi, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I hope we can all forge a path forward that embraces peace, respect, and friendship. Now, speaking of friendship, I do see some friends joining the Zoom. So thank you for joining us in real time. I do appreciate that. Uh, one quick housekeeping detail. Uh, we have three incredible panelists who are going to share their insights into today's topic. Uh, and we want to be able to hear them. So I'm going to make sure that all audience members have their mics on mute through the, the, the panel. If you want to add a comment or ask a question of the panelists, please do use the Zoom chat. If you don't know where it is, it's on the bottom toolbar of your Zoom screen. Look for the dialog bubble with the word chat underneath. If it's not on the toolbar at the bottom or if you can't see the toolbar, just hover your mouse over the Zoom screen. It'll bring up the toolbar. Or if you're watching it on a tablet, tap your screen. It'll bring up the toolbar either at the bottom or the top. If you can't see the chat icon there, it just means it's in the more section. Just look for the circle with three dots in it. Click on that. It'll bring up additional uh, menu selections and you'll be able to find chat there. If that fails, don't panic. Uh, we have some time at the end to uh, have open questions coming from the audience. At that point, you can just wave at me and I'll get you to unmute your mic and you can ask your questions there. All right. With that out of the way, let's get to today's topic. We're talking about uh, genre and style bias in the publishing industry. And I was trying to think of a way to sort of frame this and give you some context about the ground we're going to cover. And I thought the best way to do this is to get you all to remember uh, your time in high school or junior high. Now, if you remember your time in school, you probably remember that uh, students would uh, separate themselves into different groups or factions. In fact, if you remember what group you were in in high school, type in chat now what uh, what group you were in. Uh, sadly, I was not a jock. Uh, I was uh, probably nerd adjacent. Uh, I was not a math or science nerd. I was what I uh, called myself a fantasy freak because I was a huge fan of Lord of the Rings and uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And with about a half dozen other fantasy freaks, we would get together in the physics lab in the high school to play an ongoing quest of D&D. Uh, what I found curious, though, is that there was a pecking order that formed in the schools. And at my school, um, the boys volleyball team ranked the highest, right? They were the ones who got the most attention. Uh, they were the ones who were revered or feared, depending on who you were. And everybody beneath were sort of, they, they had less respect. And at the bottom of the food chain were the fantasy freaks who got together in the physics lab to play Dungeons and Dragons. Um what I found curious, though, oh, and I see some coming in. Oh, Sam says, heck, yes, Dungeons and Dragons. That's great. Uh, and somebody's in prep. Uh, smart kid, but not a nerd. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, what I found interesting is that um, when I got into the publishing world, I noticed that the similar mindset existed where certain genres had more attention than other genres. And some genres were maybe whispered about in dark corners. And it made me wonder... If this pecking order or this ranking system was something that was created by publishers in a way to help readers find titles, it was it a way to help encourage writers to submit certain types of genres. Uh, it was it something that helped or hindered the creative process. Um, 
And so we're going to try to cover that ground. And I know there's a lot of territory to cover, but thankfully we have three incredible panelists who are going to share their insights into today's topic. Now, you probably read their intro uh, in the waiting room, but I'm going to get each panelist to reintroduce themselves uh, by answering two questions. The first question is, what genre are you mostly known for writing? Or if you have multiple genres, you can mention them. But the second question I want you to answer is, how do people respond when they find out your major genre? For example, uh, when I made my transition into theater, into kids publishing, I can sum up the reaction when I had a chance meeting with um, a well-respected, successful author of adult fiction. And when he found out I was getting into kids' books, he dismissively said, oh, it'll be so easy. Spend a weekend working on a manuscript and the rest of the time is yours. Now, I was taken aback by that, but it also opened my eyes to this ranking system or this pecking order. And I knew exactly where I stood as a kids writer uh, in a physics lab and in a high school playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so I'm going to now invite each one of the panelists to share with us uh, their genre or genres and how people respond to them. And we're going to start off with uh, Farah. I'm going to bring Farah up on screen. There you are, Farah. Go ahead and let us know what you're all about. So I, um, I am a writer for both adults and teenagers, and I predominantly am known as a romance writer. I write rom-coms. I have more emotional romances. I have a mystery romance coming out this year. Um, so romance is always in my books, and I'm marketed as a romance writer, and I definitely get certain looks when I tell people I'm a romance writer. Um, I've had people say, oh, when are you going to write a real book? Oh, that must be so easy to write something that's so formulaic. Or why do your books have to have these cartoon covers or anything like that? Um, so there's definitely a stigma against my genre. It's something that I um, am used to. I started writing romance and I have no intention of stopping. So um, the stigma doesn't bother me, but it's something that I definitely have to deal with. Great. Thank you, Farah. All right. So let's uh, move over to uh, let's move over to Julie now. Julie, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work and people's responses to you? Oh, gosh. Um... I write across genres. I have a background as an academic linguist, and I've written a um, a textbook that is somewhat unconventional for a textbook. So I think the theme of my writing career has been I, I violate expectations of just about every genre that I'm in. Um, and I've uh, written and performed poetry. I have written uh, literary essays. Um, and co-edited a volume of essays. Um, I have a children's book that's going to come out uh, next year. Uh, but probably the main focus of my writing, I would characterize as literary science writing, which is really something that is not very prevalent or known. Uh, most people, when they think of science writing, they think of a very journalistic style or pop science type uh, approach to science writing. And um, my work really more and more blends elements of literary technique and kind of veers away from the conventions of science writing. Um, so that's been, I think, a challenge for me in my writing career, but also something very, very rewarding to be able to not feel confined by um, the, the box of uh, sticking to a particular genre and just being able to make use of all of the resources of the knowledge and uh, literary skills that I've accumulated over my entire life. Great. Thank you, Julie. All right. And we've got one more panelist. Uh, let's uh, bring uh, Connor on. Connor, tell us a little bit about your work and people's responses to you. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, uh, I think mine would just be more literary fiction and uh, poetry. I, uh, I do consider the poetry more of a emo cowboy poetry though, and less of a, uh, uh, just your classic work. It's very, some of the books are pretty juvenile in my opinion at this point, but I've uh, kind of focused on just, yeah, just standard kind of just fiction. Um, it has been described uh, by some blurbers as like along the lines of more Western style. Um, I'd, I'd lean into that. I think I could write a book like Lonesome Dove at some point, but uh, right now, yeah, just kind of going between emo cowboy poetry and uh, fiction. 
All right. Excellent. Thank you. I like that emo cowboy. That's very cool. All right. So uh, thank you for indulging me with that. As you can see, we have a, a, a small cross section of genres represented here and we have different viewpoints coming in. So I'm going to bring all our panelists on together and we're going to throw a question uh, out at uh, all of you. Ooh, there we go. I'm going to throw a question out at all of you and we'll work backwards this time. We'll start with Connor, uh, then to Julie and then to Farah. So we're going to start off with this one over here. Uh, are some some genres or styles more celebrated than others? If so, which ones would you say get more attention? And conversely, which ones do you think don't get as much attention? So Connor, uh, why don't you uh, kick things off? Ooh, I, uh, I'm learning more about the different worlds that some of these genres exist within. I was at a festival in Toronto earlier mm -hmm. this year, and I was speaking with um, on a panel with a, with a thriller crime fiction writer and I didn't know that there was like this whole world that existed around that and the awards that go with that as well, as well as, you know, the like the sales, the prestige, like the festivals that focus on those kind of things. Um, I think in my kind of world, it's been very much around that, like the literary, uh, literary fiction, which tends to, you know, play out in a lot of the ways that people interpret like awards in Canada here but not necessarily within within sales I don't think at the same time I feel other genres often like tend to have a uh, have a uh, better better sales in that sense um but then when you look at like something like poetry like when I I write a poetry book I assume that the only people who are going to read it are the students that I forced to either read it or um maybe like two or three of my friends who uh unfortunately have to buy it to uh, support me there. Great. Thank you, Connor. Okay. Let's go over to, uh, let's go over to Julie. Um, so the question is, uh, are certain genres or styles more celebrated than others that at least in your experience, what have you seen? I really, really love your analogy of high school and the pecking order of the various groups, because I think in many ways that that captures so well the ecosystem within publishing and writing. Um, and I think one aspect of what we're seeing now is that it's a little bit more fragmented maybe than it has been because there are, have been shifts in the power structure of the publishing industry and some reconfiguration. So I think traditionally um, literary fiction and poetry were the most celebrated um, were, you know, where you could land um, some of the uh, juiciest publishing contracts, perhaps. Um, but that has shifted, you know, so that sort of grew up very much, I think, in the tradition of um, uh, a group of elites who were very deeply trained in literary analysis and criticism and uh, sort of read a certain canon of writers and we're keen on both preserving some continuity to a literary tradition, but also in pushing innovation within that tradition. I think that group of elites has clearly been losing power. Um, and often the work that used to be published um, more prominently has now been relegated to the small presses. Uh, what's been more ascendant, of course, is the huge publishers with commercial interests. Um, that I think shape the literary landscape in different ways. Um, so their motivations, I think, and their agendas are a little bit different than the literary elites that used to hold more power. Um, they are more focused on selling volumes and often that I think um, puts a lot of focus on the marketing aspects of uh, pitching titles to certain expectations and uh, of aligning books with readers' expectations in a particular way. And then I think there's a third category of gatekeepers that is ascendant now, and that's people outside of the literary traditional literary publishing world entirely um, in the domain of self-publishing even. Um, and these are people who ma generate a massive platform of their own. So that allows them to promote their self-published books or promote other people's books um, in ways that go beyond the marketing that is done by traditional publishers. So I think things are very, very much in flux. And at the same time, there are also little subcultures and communities that like Connor alluded to um, 
some smaller than others. I imagine that the ecosystem of emo cowboy poetry is probably smaller than, say, the romance industry. Uh, but they have their own, um, I think, ways of rewarding work within, and some of them are more porous than others. Uh, so I think it's it, it, we're really in a shifting landscape right now. And it's certainly true that some uh, genres, I think, are uh, garner less respect in the mainstream media and such. Um, but I think that it's not as monolithic as it used to be. And I think that makes for a very, very interesting landscape, as far as I'm concerned. Well, thanks, you. I like that, that you're sort of breaking down. It's almost like... Um the fragmenting of um, the publishing industry is that we have the shift of power where we had a few gatekeepers. Uh, now we have sort of multiple ways that, that we can sort of reach an audience. And ultimately that, that, that can be beneficial uh, in some respects. And in some respects, it, it, it can sort of create uh, a certain homogenous kind of story. If people go, okay, well, here's where I want to shoehorn in my mm -hmm. particular style of writing because i know that you can make lots of money off of this right so so it's it's an interesting kind of landscape that we're exploring so thanks for 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 giving us that that sort of overview of it all right and uh, over to farah uh so we're again talking about uh genres that you think are more uh celebrated than others that's a really interesting question i think um for me when i hear celebrated i'm like well what do you mean by celebrated do you mean wins awards do you mean um, gets New York Times bestseller status, or do you mean um, sales, like plain old making more money? Um, obviously, um, publishing is capitalism. What sells well is what publishers are going to want to publish because they're in, in it to make money. Um, it's interesting what Julie said about how the publishing industry has changed in that way, that um, there used to be a little bit more, uh, I, I don't want to say gatekeeping, but there, there definitely used to be more of a holding on to the literary um, type books much more so in publishing. Well, now the focus is moving more towards commercial fiction. And maybe that is because that's what sells well. Um, like if you look at if you think about the hierarchy of, of what people consider important, I say important like that, because, again, what do you how do you define that term? But if you look at for example, lit fic versus romance. Romance is by far outselling liter literary fiction, and it has for many, many years. That's not a new thing. Um, romance is in the 80s and the 70s was outselling literary fiction by a lot. Um, so it's always been the the genre that the people want to purchase the most of. So why was why would it be considered the genre that has the least um, value to, to the industry? Um, so I love that things are changing. I love that people have a voice that they didn't have anymore, that they're getting attention from publishers that they didn't used to, getting attention from media that they didn't. Um, so it's great. I love all these little communities that are popping up to support different genres, because for um, for a long time, uh, those genres didn't get support from the bigger festival circuit and whatnot. Um, whether it's uh, like um, writing groups, like to, uh, we have romance writing groups, um, crime writing book groups and all those other genres that were always considered a little bit lowbrow. We have our own people that we can support each other um, and our readers will support us. So we don't have to look for that recognition from the, the larger literary elite. And I think it's fantastic that things are changing. And I think it's fantastic that we're getting more voices out there of different kinds of voices in those genres. Great. Thank you, Farah. Yeah, sort of staying with you for a second in terms of, of this, this whole notion of like certain things were lowbrow, uh, it made me wonder, like, uh, who was making those decisions in terms of, okay, so this is where this particular genre sits. This is where this one sits. Was it was it primarily the publishers? Do you do you think it was uh, something that was driven by um, uh, publicists or marketers as a way to get more attention to maybe, as you are alluding to, uh, literary fiction wasn't having the same sales as romance, so. Was this a way to try to sort of elevate uh, literary fiction into a, a category where they said, well, it's it's the awards that matter as opposed to the sales? So I'm just sort of curious on your take on that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I often wonder the same thing. It's like, who's making this call? Who decides what's, what's valued and what's not? Because if we're looking at sales, um, the sales don't represent what literary elite considers to have value or not. Um, so a lot of it, I think, Personally, I think a lot of it is patriarchy. Um, it always comes down to that. Uh, genres that are uh, read 
by women historically, for example, romance, but also cozy mysteries, even domestic thrillers, they were never considered to be as important in the literary works as the genres that tended to be re uh, read more by men, such as like gritty mysteries or high fantasy or things like that. Um, so, of course, patriarchy the um, brings us down in so many different ways, and that is one way to look at it. I also think that the academic elite has a lot to do with it. Um, it uh, people in uh, MFA programs and the professors and things pushing that uh, idea that this is the correct way to write a book or this is the correct kind of book to be called literature. Um, which doesn't always align with what the masses want, um, of course, and and as goes with everything, people always think that um, whatever most people want is of less value. McDonald's is less less good be than than other high fine dining. I mean, in my opinion, yes, McDonald's is less good than fine dining. But the idea that it's if it's built for the masses, then it's not important. Um, so I think it's that um, mindset that uh, is what is causing those hierarchies. Yeah, that's it's it's interesting that you bring that up because I, I was just sort of reflecting on uh, my time working in theater, and and predominantly you have a female audience coming to see shows. Yet when I was thinking about the artistic directors who program their seasons, and how like we're seeing some changes now where we're seeing more uh, female artistic directors uh, at the helm of of major companies. But why did it take so long to get there? Is is, is my question if because because you, you you think about well if you want somebody to sort of be representative of the audience who's actually paying money to come read your books or see your plays wouldn't you want somebody that might actually have uh, ha have a better understanding of of that audience rather than somebody who's obviously sort of imposing what they want and, and i'm not naming names but like when you see certain theater seasons planned out you're like oh this is very much the personal taste of one one person uh as opposed to trying to reach out to their audience it's it's so hard to get ahead of that like when you think about shows that do really well like bridgerton is the best um wa most watched show on netflix um barbie outsold every other movie last year and if you think about that and yet we we are still finding where where it feels like, oh, but that's niche, that's women's entertainment. When women are purchasing more entertainment than men by far, whether it's books, movies, anything like that. Great, thank you. And uh, jumping over to Connor, when we're talking about, it's it's still sticking in my mind, e emo uh, cowboy. It, it, it just <clears throat> sounds so, so, so <clears throat> incredibly cool. Uh, what are, like, did you find challenges trying to explain what what that meant? to uh, publishers, to agents, to marketers, to, to readers? Uh, like what, what's the challenge in terms of carving out something that sounds really cool, but coming across people who go, uh, it doesn't fit any sort of uh, box that I know uh, fiction should exist in or poetry should exist in? Um, I, I, I honestly don't think I tried to sell it like that until after the fact. You know, at the time I was more like, uh, this will make you a ton of money. It won't, it will never make anyone any money. Uh, writing is a terrible idea if you want to make money, um, especially in poetry. Um, but I, uh, uh, I just, uh, I, I recently, I have a, a new book coming out next year called Beaver Hills Forever Tentatively. And it's a poetic novella, which is like a, it's about a 160 page long poem. And if you ever want to try to not sell a book, write a 160 page long poem. That's a, a novella. It's like probably the worst, uh, worst thing for any publishing house to even look at or agent or anything like that. And thankfully my agent's very, um, he gets it and he gets the type of work I do. So we're, we were able to get it out there, but it's, uh, it's weird. It's weird when you're trying to like do those kind of blends of like the multi genre type thing. I find one of the funniest things that I tend to come across is especially being a prairie writer whose work is very much situated within Edmonton or the prairie provinces here is uh, being in Toronto and hearing people's interpretation of what the prairie kind of literature scene like looks like. And there seems to be a sense of almost like wonder, especially right now about the idea of um, like, like, uh, I guess like cowboy shit for lack of a better term, especially with like, you know, the new Beyonce album and different, uh, uh, there's like, a, it's got its moment right now. And so people in my like, Toronto are very much interested in this idea of a prairie uh prairie literature and what that's all about and it's it's quite funny to see that interpretation comparatively to what is often like 
shown from the novel that sells well about a you know 40 year old uh lady in toronto making money but trying to figure it all out and um living through that multi-generational wealth rather than coming back to you know this uh this kind of act out prairie existence so i uh i don't know i just find it a very interesting the work and how people interpret it uh especially when there's a little bit of a difference there okay thank you yeah and the thing that uh, sort of i pick up on that when you're talking about like people's perception of what prairie fiction is oftentimes i i feel like uh we're dealing with uh archetypes or, or more often stereotypes uh, that are either played up or or played against, right? So, so I was thinking about this uh, just in terms of expectations that people have of of a genre, right? Um, I mean, I'm old enough to remember like the first sort of Asian American uh, sort of movie that was made, uh, Joy Luck Club, right? And everyone's sort of sort of branded or 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 started conceiving if it was like an Asian story, it would be the immigrant experience, right? And what I found heartwarming is when uh, Crazy Rich Asians came out and, and wound up selling uh, tons of tickets, it, it showed another aspect of, of Asian culture. Uh, but you still have that sort of expectation that people yeah. have of, of that particular genre. Marty, do you mind if I just hop in on that point you just made there? Because I think... Yeah. That's one thing that I really am enjoying about the current uh, state of Indigenous literature and the work that's coming out now is that writers are writing for Indigenous communities and for themselves rather than for the Western audience. A lot of books that were published in the 80s, 90s, 2000s were very much focused on that Western ideal, you know, of like, oh, this Indigenous person was able to rise above their uh, intergenerational trauma and the poverty and all those things to get a good job at a university and, you know, succeed. And they were able to make it through these Western systems. And so it was success because of the system, the colonial systems were in place rather than success because of the community and success because of, you know, holding on to indigenous values and lifestyle. And so the work that's coming out now is in direct contrast to that old school one that was just propping up the Western systems. And so you got writers like, Jessica Johns with Bad Creed, Billy Ray Belcourt's work, Joshua Whitehead's work, Emily Riddles, and like the list goes on and on, Alicia Elliott, others. And, um, and it's really cool to see this because it's writing for community. And if people who aren't Indigenous read it and like it and want to learn from it, awesome, that's great. But it's not necessarily the specific targeted audience right from the get-go. So that's been kind of a very cool shift. Yeah, it's like they're no longer guided by what what is the gatekeeper's interests uh, or their expectation, what the the audience or the readers want, which leads me to a question for for Julie, right? Because because you sort of take different uh, genres and, and sort of um, cross them over with the, the the work in science and and literary fiction, and uh, I'm curious about uh, some of the challenges or some of the rewards that you face when you're sort of taking that and trying to blend it in a way that uh, will appeal to both ends, or maybe maybe it just uh, uh, creates a, a new audience entirely. So I'm, I'm curious about your experiences in terms of, of taking two genres and, and putting them together. Yeah, in a way, it's taking the hard route, I think, because there are fewer models for how to do it well. Um, and there are also real clashes of values in the type of writing that's done. So uh, most of the time when people write about scientific content, the uppermost values are accuracy and clarity. And I hold to those values as well. But in um, more literary styles of writing, especially the ones I'm drawn to, um, there's a lot of premium on uh, emotional experience, uh, the aesthetics of the language that's being used. So I... Um, I don't see my work as being primarily expository, which is very much not the case for most people who write about science. I want to create a, a, a pleasurable experience for the reader uh, where the language is very much part of that and not just a vehicle to deliver um, some information that I want to get across. Um, you know, I value ambiguity, uh, metaphor, making disparate connections, which in the scientific world, people are very leery of. Uh, so often the work involves me kind of having to identify for myself where I can push the conventions of one or the other, um, where the readers who might come from one side or the other might have their expectations violated. I think it makes the marketing of the work more challenging. But um, when it comes down to it, it's um, 
I feel really strongly that you have to write the kind of work that um, you feel driven to write. And to me, I think the scientific and literary aspects of my life have both been so important and so interwoven in my own mind that to separate them on the page um, in the way that they have been done in, in communities out in the publishing world just doesn't feel natural to me. So that's the kind of writing that I do. And then I hope that it finds an audience. Um, it, I, I definitely don't write with a particular audience in mind. I write more from the perspective of what is the kind of writing that is really organic to me. Um, and in a way, I feel I don't have a choice about that. I think it's a little bit akin to a sexual orientation, that there is a kind of writing that is you, that is how you express yourself. Um, and what is more intimate than writing, I think, uh, you have to hew close to your own literary experience, your own values, your own way of seeing the world. Um, and for me, that incorporates, you know, many different worlds that I've walked through in my life and different cultures as well. So I, I think that I bring in stylistic elements that maybe are more commonly found in my Czech heritage than they have been in um, mainstream Anglophone Canadian prose. Um, I tend to lean towards prose that's maybe a little bit more opulent, a little bit more emotional and cerebral at the same time that I see running through a lot of Czech literature, but that is less prevalent in North America. So I think all of these um, life experiences just have to find their way into my work. And and um, that's the kind of writing I have to do. Yeah, in a, in a lot of ways, it captures that whole sense of, of um, the author's voice. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you take that example of, you know, you can give a premise to 17 different writers and you'll get 17 different takes on that premise. You would never get the same story if if they know their voice, which is is oftentimes the hardest thing I, th I feel for for authors to develop is their own voice, because sometimes they listen to so many other voices that that come at them. Right. It's like, oh, I've got to think about my uh, potential reader. I got to think about that agent that I'm trying to win over, that publisher that I'm trying to get a contract with. And. And it's it's sometimes counterintuitive because it's like what people are looking for is that original, unique voice because right. they've, they've seen so many other stories written with other voices. Why would you try to emulate somebody else who's already been exactly. published? Exactly. And I think, um, you know, what my vision of a healthy literary ecosystem would be would be one that really allows each individual writer to develop that voice to the fullest, to a high, high level of skill. Um, here I'm gonna, I think maybe step in and defend a little bit some aspects of the um, traditional literary elite group um, that has historically wielded a lot of power that is now I think giving way to, uh, to other uh, forms of power. But I think one thing that has been strong within that community has been the cultivation of skills of criticism, evaluation, and literary analysis. Um, that's not to say that that group of people who engaged in that kind of work wasn't blinkered, biased by their own life experiences, their own agendas and whatnot. But I think they really did uh, put a premium on cultivating those skills. What I would love to see is the other communities developing those same skills of literary analysis and criticism to a high degree and having that be part of our literary culture in a way that it isn't anymore. Um, you know, we've all seen the waning of reviews that appear in newspapers. Uh, the art form of the review, I think, is very much on the decline. Um, I think it would be amazing if each subgenre or each, you know, each literary community um, put um, a lot of effort into developing vocabularies for identifying what makes this particular piece of writing exceptionally strong within its genre? What is it doing that is novel, unique, different, more effective than other um, examples within that genre? Um, and I think that that would allow for much more productive crosstalk across genres. Um, you know, I sometimes see on jury panels that we aim for some diversity of representation, but there isn't always a productive way that we have of talking to each other that allows uh, the member of one group to really appreciate why 
a jur jury member really, really loved a particular piece of writing that maybe fell outside of the other jurors' experience or comfort comfort zone and, as a reader. Um, so that's you know a, a bit of a plug that I would make for the value of those skills. I would like to see them not drop and fall away, but rather become more broadly cultivated across all genres. Yeah, that's a great point to make. And it sort of leads me to a question I want to ask of uh, Farah, like in, in terms of working in the, the, the romance genre, there, there are a lot of sub genres in there. And if we sort of apply that notion of raising the bar in terms of, okay, if we understand what the genre is and what is considered excellence in there, what is the mechanism in place? If we're seeing newspapers, obviously, we're, we're losing book editors. Well, we've, we've lost book editors, let's be honest. There's, we're not losing them. We've lost them all. And in its place, it seems like Goodreads has tried to sort of fill in that. But Goodreads, again, we, we come into sort of gatekeepers and talking about personal taste, right? So what what is considered a great story by one reader may not be considered a great one by the other. So how do we sort of create that kind of standard within the different genres and communities? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, it's funny, uh, romance is definitely like, that's that's the community I know best. And it's enormous with lots of subgenres, monster romance, paranormal romance, historical romance. Um, and of course, everybody has their preference for what they're reading. And and within each of these subgenres, there's definitely um, um, better better written books and um, books that are, are not necessarily to my tastes. But how do I find what I want? Um, Definitely, uh, there there are some newspapers. I know the New York Times and the Washington Post have dedicated romance reviewers that are reviewing books there. Um, but it's maybe one reviewer per newspaper. So if you're not friendly with that person, it it's tough when there's only one person. Um, so that's a that's that's definitely an issue. Um, and uh, as a uh, as a whole, I wouldn't say regular, more mainstream book reviewers will be embracing um, these niche genres as much. Um, I can't imagine a literary reviewer picking up the newest monster romance um, and looking at it with from a um, and reviewing it without their own biases coming into play. Um, so it does become difficult, especially right now with social media, bookstagrammers, and TikTok is a big one, especially for romance. Um, TikTok is what decides if a book is going to be popular or not. And TikTok decides whether a book will end up on the front table of your bookstore where it says TikTok recommends. And of course, we all know that there's definitely problematic aspects to that social media platform where uh, creators of color do not seem to be um, getting as much views in the algorithm as white creators. Um, and um, mentions of books written by people of color get a lot less attention on these in these um, social media platforms than books written by white creators. So it is it is a little bit of you got to search and you got to find what what who you trust for recommendations. There there are certain um, blogs. Um, I'm thinking like Entertainment Weekly still reviews romance. There are certain places that you find a reviewer that you trust. Um, but it definitely does it does make it difficult because as as Julie said, there isn't a language that is universal to all books. Um, for reviewing different genres. And which is understandable because of course, every genre has a different reader expectation. And if a reader is going to judge a book based on their expectations, whether they realize they're doing that or not. Um, so I think I went off a little bit there, but I think uh, I think my, my point is basically to trust your trust yourself and trust the people that you value their judgment. Well, that's to, to me, that's interesting that that whole idea of how um we we're sort of fracturing the the different genres and and there are some that are coming to light that wouldn't have come to light if we sort of kept the the old model um and, and it, it makes me wonder uh now when when you have technology and social media opening the doors to allow us to do things that we couldn't have done before uh there, there's going to be a certain point where technology is going to like take us only so far. I, I mean, I don't want to step on the toes. I think somebody already did a panel about AI, but, but like when we get to a point where um, we're connected together and we're trying to find these small pockets of communities and let's say we only have, you know, I think about my D and D days, right? A half dozen people in a physics lab playing. Now, if you translate that into book sales, I mean, 
six people buying one book uh, in a given season. I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm going to have like three or four day jobs in order to, to, to make that work. Does this mean that at a certain point with the growth and explosion of different subgenres all the way through, does it mean that the idea of a full-time writer disappears, that we have to be sort of multifaceted and find different avenues in order to sort of pay the bills? Uh, uh, so, sorry, that was sort of a rambling way <laughs> of trying to get to, to a point about how do we survive as writers in a world that gets fragmented? I guess that that's the, the short end of that question. Let, let me put that over to, to Connor. I mean, I've always had writing as a very much a, a side thing until recently, and I still need to do that. You know, I got my job at the university teaching creative writing, which I'm very fortunate to have. It's something I never thought I would ever be doing in my entire life. Um, and, uh, but like that supports it. You know, there's no, I do know a couple of people who make a, make a living off of writing, but they are also hustling hard on like the school circuit, doing events, doing different things, going to classrooms, talking, um, all of this just to like maintain and keep their doing corporate gigs all the time. Um, I personally don't have much interest in doing that kind of stuff anymore. I like hanging out with my, my students and I like uh, ignoring the rest of the university in general. Um, but uh, it's a, it's a good space for, being able to create in that in that regard at this point i i don't know i um i i wish there was a, a little bit more uh ability to survive doing this but it's yeah i don't know it's um i'm uh i'm always a fan of taking uh different jobs or odd things to try to keep uh keep things going you know i when i was writing a lot of these books i worked as either like a bird hunting guide or helped out in some of my friends like oil field operations or those kind of things just to survive and be able to kind of continue to create this, uh, this work here. Great. Thank you. And, and Julie and any tips <laughs> how we can survive if, if uh, our audience gets uh, smaller and smaller. Oh, uh, I mean, I think um, you, you apply the same principles as you do to your writing, I think, which is, uh, you try to find the things that organically fit you. So Connor talked about some of the things he's not interested in doing. Um, I think really uh, making writing work boils down to identifying what parts of the world you're going to engage in that will allow you to support your writing. Um, for me, that happens to be largely um, editing. Uh, when I'm not writing, um, I also do do a fair bit of writing for magazines, which is still one of the types of writing that I think in the kinds of work that I do does bring in um, a reasonable income. Um, I do speaking gigs, um, things that I think are related to my writing in various ways and a little bit of teaching here and there. Um, so it's a cobbling together of activities that I feel um, sort of feed off of each other a little bit. I, you know, I have also seen many writers who just do something completely unrelated as a way of earning income, um, you know, to support their writing. And that can have really, really wonderful side effects in that it immerses you in parts of the world that you might not have otherwise been immersed in if you had the means to sit and write in your office all day long. Um, and that can give you, like, I think that can broaden your perspective of the world and shake you up into uh, new ways of seeing it. Um, you know, I was aware very much of how during the pandemic, uh, when we were all so cloistered from each other, that my writing suffered from not having those incidental, unpredictable contacts with people that were unplanned and that would just provide like the seed of an idea or an observation that would make its way into my writing. And I think that that is one of the positive side effects of being forced to do something other than write as a way to earn a living is that your life is going to be filled with such unscripted moments of running into people that, uh, that you're going to have to interact with in various ways. So yeah, it's, uh, it's not an easy life. I think it never has been an easy life. I'm not sure that there has ever been a point in history where it has been easy, maybe maybe somewhat easier 30, 40 years ago in Canada. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy. You don't do it because it's easy. You do it because it's rewarding in other ways. Great. Thank you for that. And over to Farah talking a little bit about, uh, 
Well, I think before we started the panel, you said you've got two two projects on the go and two more coming up. So, so I think I know how you're able to survive. You just keep writing. <laughs> I just but keep writing. I yeah, I am a full time writer, and uh, I agree with I Julie. It's not know. easy. Um, I am I write in both adult and young adult spaces, and I didn't intend to do that. I started with adult, um, and I started writing young adult books simply because I wanted this to be my full-time job. And so instead of taking a part-time job elsewhere, I took another part-time job writing, I guess. Um, I also teach workshops. Um, I work with different organizations. Um, I am speaking engagements, whatever comes my way. I do a little bit of mentorship. I think the most important thing, if you want to be a full-time writer, if you want to make this work is to be adaptable. Um, when the market changes, when, um, for example, I write rom-coms and rom-coms do well. And um, for the last couple of years, we've had a really, really good luck in that um, that genre and rom-coms have been just booming. But as, as it changes, I'm more than willing to shift my uh, focus to maybe more emotional romances or maybe I'm going to try a fantasy because um, romanticy is doing really well. I'm still writing the books I want to write. I'm never going to write something that isn't the book from my heart. But I can adapt my bigger scope, the basically the packaging of that book from my heart can look a little bit different. So it fits with what the market wants right now. Um, so being adaptable, I think, has been the thing that any of my friends that are successful and doing this full time, they've had to learn to kind of pivot their career and make it not what they expected it to be. Great. Thank you. All right. So we, we just have a few minutes left. So I'm going to invite the audience. If you have any questions, you can post them in chat or uh, raise your hand and let us know. But meanwhile, I'm, I'm going to throw one sort of general question at everybody. We'll start with Julie, go to Connor and then uh, Farah. Uh, but uh, uh, what what are you working on now that you'd like people to know about? Uh, so uh, we'll start off. What did I say? Julie? Julie, go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, I have a book that's going to come out in October. So I guess I've more or less finished working on it. And um, the book is, this is my advanced copy. It's called Lingua File, A Life of Language Love. And uh, it is uh, really a blending of genres, as I alluded to earlier. It's quite different, I think, from um, most of my other work previously. It sort of, uh, I think, pushes the limits of science writing and uh, into uh, using techniques from lyric essay and memoir as well. Um, I'm so curious to see how this book lands in the world. So this fall will be taken up with a fair bit of promotional activities. And I just have no way of knowing how it's going to be received. But I feel that this is the book that I was, in a way, born to write. Um, I'm always thinking of next projects uh, going forward. And I have a couple of ideas on the back burner that I'd like to explore, but nothing that has yet coalesced into book form. One thing I am thinking about a lot um, because of my background in linguistics and I spend a lot of time thinking about language is the implications of artificial intelligence and its vacuuming up of human language into itself and um, what we do about that as a species. So that's something that's very much on my mind and I suspect that I'll be writing about that in the future. Great. Thank you, Julie. What 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 is going to happen to us with AI? What, what do you think? <laughs> Um, I don't know. I'll let you know after I've thought about it a whole lot and written some more. But I think it's um, um, to me what it it prompts me to really think about what language means to us as humans. And in a way, I think that this book that is coming out in October really has been my way of presenting what it means to be a linguistic human in all its facets. Um, how it's so tightly interwoven into our relationships, our way of relating to the world, our way of living our lives through the constraints of time. All of this is bound up in language. Um, so I'm very keen on presenting the richness of that in opposition to what I think is often the flattening or a very impoverished way of thinking of language as a bunch of statistical regularities that can be exploited by algorithms. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. All right, uh, Connor, Connor, tell us what you're working on. Uh, I just had a novel come out this spring called Prairie Edge um, about bison uh, getting released in downtown Edmonton and the chaos that ensues from there. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I got another poetic novella coming out next year called Beaver Hills Forever. Um, no beavers getting released in Edmonton on that one. And then I have another novel coming out in the next year after that, um, 2026, I think, uh, 
called Duck Blind tentatively. So we'll see what happens with that. And that's about a kind of cultural appropriation through approximation, not necessarily just straight up calling it out. So a new blend of that within uh, the academy as well as corporate worlds. And um, after that, I don't think I'm going to, I think I'm going to take a break from writing for a few, a uh, few years and chill out and then uh, come back to it in a bit. Did you say a few years? You're going to chill out from writing for a few years? You know, I, I always say that. I've said that after this, and I've said that after the last one, and I and I, and I chat a lot with my, my buddy Jordan Abel about that. And and then he continues to write a book like every year, it seems, or every two years. And, and I'm like, well, as soon as you chill out, I'll chill out. I mean, it's, okay. it's work. I think we're, we're going to figure it out together at some point. Okay. All right. All right. And over to Farah, what are you working on now? So I'm kind of in promotion mode still. I had a book come out earlier this month called Just Playing House. Uh, I have a copy of it here. So this, oh, it's on the screen too. Um, so I'm kind of promoting that. That's my newest adult rom-com. It's um, a second chance romance. Um, but really it's about a woman coming to terms with her uh, with her health. It's got a bit of a medical thing to it. Um, and it's I I mean it's really about a woman coming to terms with her own limitations of her body um and then I have a uh, mystery coming out this is the cover I'm not sure if you have a copy of that this is a um early oh look at that um so that's an early release copy remember me tomorrow is a college age YA um which is kind of a mishmash between paranormal romance time travel romance and um and a, a mystery um so it's my kind of going all over the place genre book so i'm uh, as julie said i'm very curious to see what readers think of it because i've never written anything like it um i call it my um my uh, uh genre soup book um but it's coming out in october as well and then i'll have two more books next year but i don't know when or or what they're even called yet i've written them i just don't know what the title final titles are oh wow Okay, all right. Uh, that that's a challenge. Uh, sorry, I, the titles are the bane of my existence. <laughs> I, I think yeah. every title I've submitted to my publisher, they're like, no, no. <laughs> pick a different one. Uh, so this brings us to the end of our time for this panel. My thanks to uh, Farah, Julie, and Connor for uh, being a part of this and sharing your insights into this whole notion of genre and style bias. Hopefully the audience uh, got some takeaways from this. Uh, I think being true to your voice, I think, is the one takeaway that I would uh, hold on dearly to. If you're writing, don't think about the genres. Don't think about anything other than the story that you want to tell. That's the thing that I, I would hold on to. Uh, so thank you to our three panelists for taking the time to be a part of this. Thank you to our audience for joining us in real time. And if anybody's watching the recording or listening to the podcast of this, hello from the past and thank you for being part of this. Take care, one and all. Have a great day and we'll see you around and uh, tune in for the next uh, controversy at noon. Take care, everybody. We'll see you around.